Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar titled Applying Data Science to User and Entity Behavior Analytics. My name is Stephanie and I'll be your host. Before we get started, I want to review a few housekeeping items and let you know how you can participate in today's session. You have joined today's webinar listening through your computer speaker system by default. If you would like to call in using the phone, just locate your audio pane and select Use Telephone. The dial-in information access code will then be displayed. You also have the ability to ask questions using your questions pane. Simply type in your question and click send. At the time of the presentation, we will do a Q&A session and take as many questions as we have time for. At this time, I would like to introduce today's featured speaker, Exabeam's Chief Data Scientist, Derek Lin. Derek leads the data science team and works with Exabeam security experts to build user behavior analytics into the product. Prior to Exabeam, Derek was with RSA Security and Pivotal, where he applied data science to fraud and cyber threat detection. We also have Exabeam's Chief Marketing Officer, Rick Kasha, who will join Derek for the Q&A portion of today's webinar. All right, enough for me. Let's turn the time over to Derek. Thank you, Stephanie. And uh, to those of you on the phone, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. So I'm here today to talk to you on how data science can be applied in user behavior analytics or UBA for short. As we know, the goal of user behavior analytics is to help early identify and detect insider threats. This is actually a fast growing market within the security field because uh, insider threat is a problem that most companies uh, face right now. Yet, I believe there's a confusion or at least a lack of details out there when it comes to understanding when, what, or how UBA is done particularly when it comes to data science. So my goal in the next 40 minutes is uh, I hope to shed some light on this area from Exabeam's perspective and also from a data scientist's perspective. And hopefully you will come away with a better understanding on, on the why and the how of data science applications for UVA. So then the, age, the agenda for this talk is as follows, right? After I described the, uh, the motivation for using data science for UVA in more detail, I will talk about our philosophy of taking a certain approach for building the system to address insider threats. Then I will talk about the main tools used, such as statistical uh, analysis and machine learning and how they are applied to UBA. All right, <clears throat> the problem. So why data science for UBA? Insider threats are a very real cybersecurity risk that are faced by many companies. We all know the Snowden Affairs is the uh, quintessential example of the threats. A threat of this type is hard to detect by conventional signature-based approaches to a security, to a, you know, to a security information and events management system. The Snowden-like activities are no different than any other activities um, from the trusted employees. And uh, because of that, uh, conventional signature-based rules fail to detect them, why, right? I mean, there's no malware involved, no credentials are compromised, there's no known MD5 hash-based signatures or uh, blacklisted IP addresses to match against. But there are behavioral cues that we can catch using statistical analysis and looking for patterns of anomalies. And this is basically where data science comes in for UBA, right? One can certainly uh, design some patterns manually, but even if there is a way, it is not practical. These days, the volumes, the velocity, and the variety of the security logs, um, you know, basically they dictate that we must use some kind of automated method to discover patterns from these logs. And, and, and uh, this is where I claim that data science is the only way to go. So in the next three slides, maybe, with, uh, you know, maybe I will spend a few minutes each, I will share with you our high-level philosophies in our approach of using data science in building a UBA system before I uh, dive in deeper to provide more concrete examples. All right, um, so this slide is about data pre-processing data pre and, and the stateful tracking. For uh, data science, all start from data, right? Data from log sources have to be pre-processed to be meaningful. Data need to be parsed, you know, and Informative data need to be removed, while useful data elements are retained and processed further. This data preprocessing step is it's very, very important, right? 
Uh, you know, you know, all data scientists know that when given some data for a use case, we can spend uh, as much as 80% or even 80% you know, of project time or even more just to understand things, parse, normalize, and uh, otherwise organize the data to the right form before we even start talking about algorithms. In, in fact, a lot of times it is not the types of the algorithms that make a difference that make a difference, but it is the effort that we put it into this data preprocessing that makes or breaks the project. There's, there's a lot of security expertise needed to make this happen. At Exabim, we, uh, we have invested heavily in this, you know, in this area of a data, data, data processing. So after the data processing work, we, uh, we massage the streams of a normalized but independent data events from different uh, data sources to proper information units before starting any analysis. This process, you know, this, or this patented procedure, is what we call uh, stateful tracking here in, you know, at Exabim. With um, stateful tracking, we organize the independent events into user sessions. A user session is basically a sequence of uh, you know, user events starting from the time when the user first logs into a network to the time when the user log to the time when the user logs out. Um, stateful tracking stitches activities across accounts, devices, IP addresses, and any external alerts in a user session. This is how we maintain all state changes over time in a user session to include um, uh, say, for example, you know, the, the all important account switching activities happening during a session. This is one of the most, um, I would say, that one of the more important technologies that we set Exabim apart from the other vendors. And uh, I say it's important because it's important in the following two ways. First, stateful tracking organizes events to blocks of um, information units for analysis and, uh, and, and learning. From data science perspective, when we abstract the data in terms of sessions, we will be counting things in number of sessions and uh, not in number of raw events. Counting in the label of sessions, it's much more stable and less noisy as compared to counting in you know, raw events. Uh, there are, of course, other implications in maintaining sessions. User sessions are really the most natural information units for um, anomaly detection. Uh, once you have sessions, you can now derive feature vectors on them and design a nice vector space on top of which you can apply a machine learning method to find outliers. This is a discussion, a bit, I mean, this is a, another topic which uh, we can reserve uh, this, you know, another time for, uh, for a later discussion. Um, so in addition to the data science value, stateful tracking also facilitates forensic investigation, as I have uh, said here in the slide. Given a high scoring session, you can now readily see a time sequence of events, some anomalous and some normal, all pre-stitched pre and organized for you. It will be very easy for an analyst to make a story out of this, um, you know, coher coherence set of events. Otherwise, the analyst would have a difficult time piecing things together by himself. All right. So um, to summarize this slide, stateful tracking by sessions is a key building block for Exabeam's data science work. All right. Let's move on to the next slide. Um, so after we massage the raw raw data logs to sessions. How do we then use data science to get a set of anomalies as the output? So at Exabim, we don't believe in a pure data-driven approach. <laughs> this may sound like a strange thing uh, for me to say, especially when it's coming from a data scientist, right? But our philosophy is that a data-driven um, engine must be fortified with expert-driven knowledge to have an optimal UBA system. There's a lot of hype today, I, I believe, about data science uh, this case, uh, these days that it can somehow produce some insights directly from data, uh, like a magic. 
but uh, it, it is not a cure-all. Some use cases are better suited for a pure data-driven approach. Uh, for example, like deep learning that, work, that, that we know that you know, they works wonder for image and language processing tasks. However, for a great majority of use cases, it is an open secret among the data science um, practitioners that this is not, you know, it is not uh, what algorithm you choose that matters the most, but it is the amount of the human effort that you spent on the data understanding, data wrangling, and data massaging that matters the most. And uh, this is actually particularly true for data in our security logs, where we of often do not have a ground truth for conventional machine learning. So, you know, I strongly believe there is a need for human elements in this work. If you pure, on the other hand, right, if you purely um, rely on human to do the work, then you would have what we call a, a pure expert-driven approach, um, as on the left-hand side of the uh, slide or a rule-based system where each rule is uh, ha basically handcrafted with a deterministic behavior. But for this, the advantage is that you know, the result will be easily, explain ex easily explainable and there is no need for data or data science. But handcrafted rules are not easily ex extensible behind a particular environment or, an, or known threats. On the other hand, a pure uh, data-driven method can work with different environments and threats as a, as a central mathematical framework can adjust itself, right? However, it does need either some pre-labeled ground truth to guide the learning. Otherwise, you risk running into high false positive rates. Unfortunately, uh, in security work, labeled ground truth in the form of a past security breach record is just very hard to come by for a pure data-driven approach to succeed. So and as a result, right, we, uh, we, we take a high, you know, that's why we take a hybrid approach to get the best of the both worlds. I mean, this is not necessarily a new thought, right? Incorporation of expert knowledge to a data-driven system can come in different uh, possibilities. For example, it can come in from, you know, in the form of, a, um, I guess, a feature designs, as in the typical vector space-based uh, learning method, or it, it can come in the form of a, a leveraging prior knowledge as in the Bayesian framework, typically used in medical or manufacturing diagnostic systems. For XRBIM, this hybrid approach created by our security team and data science team takes the form of a collection of a statistical rules, which I would uh, uh, talk about uh, shortly. Okay, so the last thought I want to share with you on our philosophies in applying data science for UBA is uh, to keep things simple. We truly believe a UBS system should look and feel like an iPhone, right? Uh, something that's very simple to use, but with plenty of a complexity hidden under the hood. And we design our analytical approaches accordingly. Uh, the system needs to, be, uh, need to allow easy configurations and uh, reconfigurations. A data science model that, re that require model refreshing or retraining from the very beginning of the time, every time when you want to reconfigure some setting, it's just not practical. This means whatever analytical model we design, it needs to adapt and cope with changes on the fly. Keeping it simple also means outputs must be easily expandable. Security analysts are busy dealing with all kinds of alerts all the time. They want to feel comfortable with the leads that you are presenting to them for them to invest the time to investigate further. So whatever anomalies we are flagging must be um, self-explanatory and supported by evidences like uh, charts, histograms, uh, historical data statistics. So part of this, of course, also ties back to the uh, stateful tracking I described earlier. Um, you know, a raised anomaly is best presented together with both anomalous events and normal events organized in a stateful session for analysts to quickly see if the anomaly in question is serious or not. So to summarize this slide again, you know, it is the belief of keeping things simple that drives the developments in the use of a statistical analysis and machine learning, which I will now talk about. So let me describe the use of a statistical analysis and the next, uh, and uh, after, after this section, I would uh, talk about the use of machine learning. 
statistical profiling for UVA. The, uh, the concept is very simple. Uh, the idea is to profile the entity behavior using historical data and measure deviation from the norm. But uh, there is actually a lot of art to it. And, uh, and this is the way I hope to shed some light in this slide. First, let's clarify some terms here. When we say UVA, the entities to profiles is not really just about users. In fact, to do UVA right, Exabim must profile all network entities, including hosts, machines, and uh, of course this also extends to profiling on the applications or processes uh, so long, as long as you have this data. So some people say UBA, some people say UEBA, where E will stand for entity, as if these are two different type of anal analytics. From my perspective, these are marketing terms. UBA has always been about behavior monitoring of any entities, not just about users. Uh, so let me just give you one example here. For example, right, um, from a user profile, if you see a user access a device in a time frame that is um, out of the norm, is this an anomaly from this, um, you know, from this user profile? We should also check the, the, the device profile itself, you know, the, the device that this user have access for the first time. If the device has been, has been shown to only um, exclusively access by this user, then I would say, you know, you know uh, this, um, this event is probably not an anomaly. In any case, to do um, UBA right, you need a full view, which means we do need to profile across all entities, users or not, and across all data sources. Okay, so much for UBA versus UEBA. Let me uh, go back to the rest of the slide again. So, so um, this slide summarizes what we do in creating the profiles. Given uh, available data sources, say on the left-hand side of the slide, this ranges from you know, your typical uh, AD data, VPN data, but you can also include things like uh, physical access data, um, uh, badging data, uh, database access logs, file access logs, uh, application logs, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, we, we, we should decide which types of a statistical ent entity profiles to design per user, per host, per process, per peers, per event types, or per account types. There a lot of variabilities here, but this is where security experts' um, knowledge will come in handy. They, um, you know, we have uh, security experts here, and uh, they need to help the data scientists in this design process. This goes back to the earlier slide that I, you know, that where I said, we, we do take a balanced, a balanced approach in the expert-driven approach versus data-driven approach, where we combine um, you know, the best of those, both worlds. So the statistical profiling is, um, is, um, um, is, is all about uh, frequency-based histograms, where we construct them from, the historical, from historical data. Different types of histograms are used for categorical, numerical variables, or even you know, special numerical variables that respect calendar information. Right. That's in the middle of the slide, uh, which describes different type of histograms. Once, and I will give uh, some examples later for say a uh, categorical, uh, example of an uncategorical histogram and an example of a numerical histogram. So once we have these histograms, we can use it to do anomaly scoring. Conventional hypothesis uh, testing for statistical analysis using p-value you know, to, in order to flag, uh, to flag outliers is a good way to go. But in addition, we do a number of other useful things to condition the histograms to make the results more, more uh, reliable. And this is um, uh, where the art is, right? Some of the things, you know, to do, I mean, some of the things that we do here include checks to see if the, the built profiles have converged or not. Um, um, or uh, if we need to do, um, if we need to automatically amplify or reduce the scores based on certain uh, particular properties of the histogram. In addition, we also take care of the profiling so that no bad anomalous events have a chance to, to, uh, to pollute the histograms that are meant to capture uh, normal behaviors. <clears throat> so in terms of the, um, how easy uh, it is to create uh, these new profiles, uh, we, we make it simple to define and configure what profiles and rules we want to track. Everything is uh, highly configurable in a configuration file language 
in the field, I have seen most of the time, there has really been no need to do additional custom design um, on the, for, you know, for additional histogram profiles and rules uh, um, because the system basically works out of the box. But the, you know, the flexibility of doing something a little more spatial is there. Okay, um, so here, uh, this is where I'm going to give you an example of um, of uh, user profiling over uh, you know categorical um, uh, histograms. Um, so this is an example of uh, profiling countries that the user Alex has logged on from say um, over a period period of uh, three months. You know this is a typical time we are tracking for the user behavior. So over this say over the period of uh, three months, we can observe that um, Alex. You know, the user came in from UK, I mean US uh, 15 times, uh, UK for 10 times, France for 3 times, and Germany for 12 times. <coughs> and with this kind of histo historical data, we can, you know, we have this histogram, and then we can uh, establish a simple um, hypothesis testing rule using a p-value, right, to yield a threshold, say, um, 4, such that uh, if the count of the current country, such as Russia, falls below that threshold, the current event will be uh, flagged for anomaly. So this is a very simple uh, profiling uh, for tracking countries a user visited. <clears throat> there are over a hundred um, other uh, profile types that we track. Some profiles are tailored for different specific event types. For example, um, a user's profiles over uh, devices for only logon events or for only uh, re or for only uh, re for logon events versus um, you know remote access events, some profiles are for two-way tracking. For example, users profiles over devices and the device profiles over users. Right? Some profiles use p uh, you know they they are based on peers. In any case, designs and choices of all these profiles are driven by security experts with um, data scientists uh, data scientists uh, supporting them. Okay, in addition uh, to profiling categorical data described in the last slide, we also need to profile numerical data. An example of a numerical data is the, uh, the number of assets, you know, like uh, for example, the, the number of assets a user have logged down to, right, that's one example, or, you know, session length in hours for this user. This, this type of uh, data are kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, numerical data. They are not categorical data. These are numbers. But we can still use histograms for profiling. For that, we must define the histograms uh, bin, you know, histogram bins over the numerical axis. Um, there are, you know, different uh, ways or different alternatives. One way is to um, uniformly bucket the numbers to a constant fixed width bins. But um, it is better to bucket the numbers to bins dynamically. Right? Let's uh, take um, you know the, the example here on the slide that, uh, where we want to profile you know, number. We, we want to profile uh, the number that that tracks the number of users, um, the number sorry, the number of servers the user log on in a session. With a proper dynamic binning or bucketing of numeric ranges, we can say in the past three months this user Alex has um, say 80 sessions. Now each session sees one to five server logons. Thirty-two sessions. That each session sees eleven to twelve server logons, and uh, two sessions where each session sees um, you know thirty some logons. By building this type of histograms, we can see you know what uh, his typical normal server logon counts per session is. So the normal normal uh, normal counts per session might be um, such as the bins of a uh, one to five or uh, 11 to 20, you know, uh, server logon counts. And then future sessions outside of these ranges are considered uh, anomalous. We can do a uh, such classification based on hypothesis testing just as before. Now to build a histogram of this type, we uh, need to cluster the numerical data, or in this example, the number of the server logon per session into uh, groups or buckets. For example, one to five, you know, that's a bucket 6 to 10, and then 11 to 20. Instead of a manually bucketing, this is where a machine learning algorithm can actually um, uh, come in handy. 
we, uh, we can use a bottom-up uh, clustering approach by successfully merging closest numerical uh, values together <coughs> until some uh, convergence criteria is met. Here, a conventional criteria is um, uh, si what we call this um, sil silhouette coefficient, which basically is a measure that desires a clustering property that data points within a group should be as tight as possible, and data points across different groups should be as far as possible. All right. Um, so in the last two slides, <coughs> excuse my voice, I told you that um, uh, network entities are profiled with, with uh, histograms. We then have um, you know, statistical rules based on uh, hypothesis testing using p-values, uh, among other things, to declare if the current event is anomalous or not. But let me remind you, though, that these rules are not your conventional points-in-time deterministic rules to flag simple things like, um, I don't know, if you have more than some numbers of assets, uh, logons at any given time, right? But, but these are rules that in actually incorporate long-range historical behavior facts as modeled by the histograms. Uh, in fact, a lot of smart and uh, hard work has gone into designing and building of these histograms. These histograms are the product of a non-trivial stateful data, you know, stateful, stateful tracking, uh, and data preprocessing, expert design, and various uh, histogram conditionings that have uh, proven to work uh, in the field. So these statistical rules have the uh, main advantages of uh, keeping things simple for our uh, end users. How? First, um, you know, this is uh, basically a complete uh, white box approach. Um, so instead of doing some, you know, for example, support vector machines to flag alerts, which is, uh, you know, a very much a black box, a black box approach where the output is hard um, to interpret. With the statistical rules, it's rather easy to see uh, why a, a statistical rule is triggered by simply uh, visually comparing the current, the current data against historical profiles, right? <clears throat> Then, um, with a st stateful tracking, the, the, the massages event to sessions scores from triggered uh, statistical rules within a session are combined for the session score. So as a result, the highest scoring sessions are prioritized and presented to the user. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, at this time, the an analyst can easily see why a session is, is a scored high simply by looking at the rules triggered in the, in the session. So it makes things are very simple and very easy to interpret. And, and finally, the use of statistical rules uh, allows us to have a very um, easy uh, configurations. Um, the, the, these are histogram-based profiles, and the rules can be easily added or modified in an easy configuration language, as I have mentioned uh, some slides earlier. So if we have a new set of data or new insights, it's literally a matter of minutes before you can configure or, uh, for the right profiles and rules. Uh, trying to keep things, things uh, simple to use, right? <clears throat> uh, and, and, fi and finally, because the, the rules are co-designed by security experts and data scientists, and there are more than a hundred, there are more than a, a hundreds of them, right? These rules are, are basically you know, what I call the, they are infused with the security um, expertise. And this goes back to the theme of taking a hybrid um, expert-driven and, and the data science-driven approaches. These are expert-driven uh, and, and this expert knowledge infused statistical rules, they do capture the best of the both worlds. Okay, so um, statistical analysis is only part of, a, of, a, of our data science story. By itself, it's, it's not enough. While statistical analysis makes the bulk of anomaly detection and alerts raising capability for UVA, machine learning further supports and augments the statistical analysis. For uh, UBA, a big role of machine learning is to, gain, it is to gain visibility to the enterprise network to uh, provide context in order to calibrate the alerts raised by statistical analysis, you know, I mean, the, with, the, with the purpose of uh, reducing the false positives. For example, we need to know if the host it's a server or a workstation in order to start a new uh, user session. You know, as I'm going across, you know, going, going, going through the slide here. 
<coughs> we also need to know if an account is a human user account or a service account in order to explain if a certain if a certain volume of the activities is normal. We also need to know what the assets, you know, what are the assets um, belonging to uh, whether the assets are, you know, whether the assets belong to executives, so we can pay more attention to them. Or, you know, if a user accessed an asset for the first time, it is probably not anomalous if we also know that the peers of the user has accessed the assets, uh, the same assets uh, before. All this contextual information, the host type, the account type, executive assets, and user peer grouping, they are not always readily available or, or complete, right, in an in a inter, in enterprise environment in the IT environments, because um, the IT uh, enterprise IT environments are very complex. They have lots of uncertainties and uh, lots of uh, ill-defined uh, data sets. But this is where machine learning can be used to dynamically, dynamically estimate this uh, contextual information. So in the next few slides, uh, I will think like uh, three slides, let me give you some detailed examples on, um, on how we are using machine learning um, to uh, to estimate this context. Um, these are some of the patent uh, painting ideas and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the work that we have. <clears throat> so the first example I'm going to give you is for host classification. In, uh, in various analytics, it is useful to know the nature of the host for the context. Right? So to classify if a host is a workstation or a server, we can do supervised learning method. Supervised learning requires some ground truth first. We all know that as a data scientist. For their, I mean, for this particular use case, some ground truth is available. I mean, by by simply looking up to the Active Directory data. Uh, okay, I say some ground truth, but not all of them, right? <clears throat> but basically, here for each host, we can look it up to um, to its uh, uh, LDF tags or certain uh, OS attributes to come up with a set of a host that we know as for sure that are either workstation or servers. And this set of initial labels is then further augmented by some other algorithms to, uh, to create um, a larger set of, uh, of, uh, of a ground truth. Uh, with that, then we can design some features for learning. Right? So um, many, many features are possible to, uh, to define, but we, uh, we, we, you know, we oftentimes here we get help on security experts' inputs. Um, so uh, an example, a feature may be the, um, say for example, the average number of uh, 4769 events occurring for this uh, host on this day. So you know, we can define 10 plus more uh, features. And the idea is to build a, a classifier to classify which host is a workstation and which one, which host is a classifier on this 10 plus uh, dimensional, uh, high dimensional feature, feature space with uh, learning guided by the known labels. Once the model is developed, um, for example, um, uh, like uh, we can use um, you know, different uh, methodology to train the model, for example, a decision tree or something else, you know, it, can, it then can be used to classify uh, uh, future unknown hosts that we wish to classify. So this slide basically shows you know, that you know, there's a training phase and a classification phase in the um, <coughs> In the, in, the, in the conventional uh, supervised uh, learning uh, uh, framework. So another example of uh, using machine learning to estimate context is to determine whether an account is human user account or a uh, service account. This is useful to know because service accounts, service account and user accounts do behave very differently. Knowing the nature of the account is useful for alert calibration. We, uh, we can do the account, class, account classification by combining learning from the two different uh, data sources. The first, or the top portion of the slide, is to use Active, active, I'm sorry, active Directory's LDIF text data using uh, supervised machine learning uh, to classify accounts based on the key value pairs present in the Active Directory's text data. The second, or the bottom section of the slide, is to use the event logs generated by each account and leverage them to construct some volumes or velocity-based features. Once these features are available, we then can dynamically identify a threshold for classification. Right? For example, if an account is observed uh, to connect to more than some number of assets, 
and that number, you know, of course, has to be dynamically determined from the some history. We, so we, then we can, we, you know, if we see, um, you know, the threshold is uh, exceeded um, for this current event, then we can deem such an account as a service account. So for this application, we uh, we combine information from uh, different data sources, from the Active Directory, so text data, and uh, also from the event logs, the behavior data. This is an example of a multimodal learning where different data sources with different learning modalities are used to come up with the best account classification. All right, <clears throat> so here's a one last example of applying machine learning um, um, to do a context estimation. At Exabim, right, the, uh, the use case of a machine learning for UBA is not limited to context estimation. I'm sorry, yeah, I'm sorry, yes, that's right. The, the use case for machine learning for UBA is not limited to a context estimation to help reduce the false positives. Well, in this, for this particular example, it's actually a machine learning application that is used uh, for a uh, targeted uh, detection uh, use case, particularly for algorithmically uh, generated uh, domain name detection. So what is um, algorithmically generated domain names, right, or AGD? Um, some malwares are known to do outbound communications to, um, to domain names that are randomly uh, generated from alphanumeric characters. Because they are random, it is impossible to catch them with deterministic or signature-based rules. To catch these domain names that have a random look and feel, we, uh, we use a standard uh, natural language processing technique that is based on engrams. The main idea here is that the web domains are meant for human readability. So, so later pairs, I mean, or you know, combination of letters in the legitimate domain names must exhibit some non-random behaviors that we want to capture using uh, n-grams uh, modeling techniques. When the n in the n-gram is equal to two, we we are interested in the statistical properties of any given pair of a consecutive characters or consecutive alphanumeric characters. This is called a bigram. And let me clarify this a bit um, for the bigram use for, the, for this a bigram use case. So in a, in, a, in a large population of a legitimate domain names, a letter A most likely has a strong likelihood of being followed by uh, you know, another letter N, for example. But a letter Q probably has a very low likelihood of being followed by a letter X. This bigram models can be trained from a large corpus of normal web domain names. And that's uh, basically, that's where the upper part of the slide is describing, right? Then given an unknown domain name to score, we can estimate the likelihood that its uh, character sequences can be, gener can be generated by the trained bigrams. This scoring is described, you know, uh, as described in the bottom half of the slide. A low likelihood means that the domain name is random. And then, you know, that's, so that's a, like a good candidate for HD um, uh, domain names. Now, after this, we can then combine with other context or indicators to finally decide if we have a case of um, uh, true algorithmically uh, generated domain names or alerts. All right, so in conclusion, um, uh, I guess it's over 40 minutes now. Uh, so in, in conclusion, over in this talk, I have shown uh, to you our philosophy on how we best use data science for UBA, right? We take a hybrid approach to combine uh, expert-driven method and data-driven method. It is what I call a security um, knowledge-infused data science. And then for a core UBA system, we use a statistical analysis to raise anomalies to keep things simple. But we rely on machine learnings to both gain understanding of uh, complex network for context derivation and also for uh, certain uh, selected uh, targeted uh, use cases. So with that, let me open up uh, the floor for the Q&A. Okay, so. Uh, okay, let me see. Um, I'm just going through the, going through the, the question here. Okay. Um, the the first questions um, uh, coming from uh, Fred. Okay, let me just try to repeat the question here. 
So there are other UVA companies touting the same UVA messages using uh, data analytics. How does uh, Exabeam's approach differ uh, from them? Um, okay, so I, I cannot comment on what other vendors' technology are since I do not uh, work for them. But I, I think uh, not all UVAs are, are created equal. In many ways, data science is uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's an art, right? There, there is no way of doing, there's no one way of doing things. The design of choices of, of uh, approaches are very much dependent on the team. I, I have given you a deep dive of our philosophies and execution of approaches. But maybe, you know, I guess I can quickly summarize here again. So basically we use histograms, right, um, to, to raise alerts. And then uh, we use, um, you know, we use statistical analysis to raise alerts. And then we use uh, machine learning to understand the complex IT environment, right? So that, and that's what we do. But uh, how do we um, differ from the rest of the field? Um, uh, again, I cannot compare how things differ under the hood. Um, um, but I, I do know that XRBM system has a consistently proven its value in the field with a quick time to value you know, in terms of uh, flagging the uh, interesting alerts. We also um, have shown to the client that the system is uh, very simple to use. Um, maybe uh, you know, a quick time, to quick time to value and ease of use are uh, at least the two things that I would say that are our uh, main uh, differentiators. Okay. Okay, and I have a question coming from Uri. Uh, the question is, um, I guess uh, it goes back to the numerical um, histogram. Uh, the question is why for numerical data uh, don't I assume normal distributions? So, so, so we, we, we do not want to assume normal distribution because um, we do not know <laughs> that data are normally, distribution, uh, normally distributed. Uh, it's as simple as that. And, uh, and because of that, we have uh, we need to have a way of uh, um, doing uh, this uh, dynamically um, you know bucketing of the of the um, uh, dynamically clustering of the uh, histograms to um, you know, to to get the best results. I mean I mean I guess the the simple answer is um, you know we we just cannot assume that data is normally distributed all the time. All right. Uh, next questions um, coming from Kaushik. Uh, do you do a uh, peer analysis? Um, uh, yes, we do. So, uh, if a user triggers a first-time access alert to a host, we can uh, calibrate the alert by seeing if any of the peers had accessed, you know, the very same host before, right? If none of the uh, peers have accessed the host uh, before, um, we do want to cr increase the score. So, the, I guess the question is, uh, where do we get uh, the peers? Um, surely, Active Directory database is the data source that we can look up to find the user's peers, right? Because every, you know, Active Directory data, we can see uh, which user belongs to what department. Um, however, however, right, um, the data oftentimes is not complete. So what is more interesting is, um, you know, if we can dynamically find the peer information using behavior data. This is actually um, a IP pending um, 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 material, but I mean the idea is that using data we can we can find we can even try to find the functional roles of the users, and and uh, that serve yet another piece of contextual information, right? So yes, we are doing uh, P analysis. Okay. All right. Okay. I I think uh, we are kind of um, um, running short on the time. At this point, I'm going to pass um, the the mic to Stephanie. Stephanie? Great, thank you. And thank you everyone. We appreciate you for being here. We'll send you the archive recording and PowerPoint deck within the next 48 hours. We also encourage you to check out the additional resources we have in our library on exabeam.com. This includes a white paper on the subject written by Derek. If you're ready to see our product in action, please visit us at exabeam.com forward slash product forward slash demo. Thanks again for joining us and we look forward to hearing from you soon.